There are QR codes provided both for the Q&A portion of the session and for our live polling questions. For those of you in the session room, please take a moment to scan the QR code displayed on the screen to your device so you can participate in the Q&A and the live polling during this session. For those of you joining virtually, you will find there is a box to the right of your screen with tabs for electronic Q&A, live polling, and feedback. We are starting off this morning with two live polling questions to reflect on the past year and how effectively we have leveraged risk-informed decision-making, both at the NRC and in your organizations. Please go to the polls tab on the virtual conference platform or I guess and we need to bring up the first two live polling questions. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Um, so uh, please go to the polls tab on the virtual conference platform or text the code shown on the screen. We'll look at those results in just a few minutes. If you did not already see it, I recommend viewing our Be Risk Smart in RAND video playing out in the foyer area. It illustrates the Be Risk Smart steps, highlighting its usefulness as an intuitive tool that the agency is using for decision making across the breadth of NRC's activities. I want to give a shout out to the creative team, Andres Rowe, Zachary Helgart, and Delon Atkinson, and also to those that supported its development, including Jeffrey Miller, Mirabelle Shoemaker, and the NMSS BRIS Smart Team, as well as a thanks to the RIC team, Lorna Kipfer and the RIC AV team. I am ceaselessly impressed with the creativity and innovation our new folks bring to the agency. BRISK Smart is a vital tool for the staff to integrate risk insights into NRC decisions and the agency culture. We could go back to the title slide. I am honored to be chairing today's session. Over the past two days, the importance of risk-informed decision-making has been a key topic in a number of sessions. It was featured during the chairs and the EDO plenary presentations and was a topic of several questions during the regional session yesterday afternoon. As you can see from the agenda, we will have brief presentations from the panelists, followed by a roundtable panel discussion, and then transition to the Q&As. Let me introduce our distinguished panel members, and then we'll check in on the results from the live polling questions. The first speaker is Mr. Mike Franovich. Mr. Franovich joined the NRC in 1990 as a general engineer in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, or NRR. Since joining the NRC, he has held positions of increasing responsibility including project manager in NRR, nuclear engineer in the Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards, resident inspector at McGuire Nuclear Station, and senior reliability and risk analyst in NRR, chief probabilistic risk assessment and operational support and maintenance branch in NRR, an executive technical assistant in the Office of the Executive Director for Operations, assistant for reactors for former Commissioner Ostendorf, and chief of the programmatic oversight regional support branch in NMSS, he was also the Deputy Director of the Japan Lessons Learned Division in NRR and Deputy Director in the Division of Safety Systems, Risk Assessment, and Advanced Reactors in our Office of New Reactors. In January 2018, he assumed his current position as Director in the Division of Risk Assessment in NRR. Mr. Franovich received a Bachelor's Degree in Nuclear Engineering from the University of Florida and a Master's Degree in Reliability Engineering from the University of Maryland. He is a graduate of NRC's SES Candidate Development Program. Our second presenter today will be Mr. Doug True. Mr. True is NEI's Chief Nuclear Officer and a Senior Vice President of Generation and Suppliers. Mr. True is a veteran of the nuclear industry with more than 35 years of experience in nuclear regulatory policy and implementation, playing a substantial role in U.S. policies and regulatory activities ranging from industry response to challenges like Fukushima and 9-11 to major contributions to the formation and implementation of risk-informed regulation. Prior to joining NEI, he served as Executive Vice President of the Power Services Group at Jensen Hughes. In this position, he was responsible for one of the largest specialty engineering organizations in the nuclear industry, covering a broad range of analysis, testing, design, and research consulting services. 
Mr. True previously served on the NEI Board of Directors and has been a contributor to NEI, Electric Power Research Institute, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, and federal government guidance on a broad spectrum of technical and regulatory issues. Mr. True earned a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Our third presenter is Mr. Cody Schnaufer. Mr. Schnaufer serves as Division Manager, Safety Risk Management Division, the Flight Standards Service at the Federal Aviation Administration. Mr. Schnaufer began his career at the Federal Aviation Administration in 2014 as a flight test engineer in the Aircraft Certification Service responsible for testing and certification of new aircraft models. He transferred to the Flight Standards Service where he served in progressively more responsible positions, including manager of evaluation programs and manager of systems assessments. In his current position, he leads his team responsible for implementing a safety management system within <coughs> flight standards, developing the flight standards workforce safety management system competency, and supporting the identification, mitigation, and monitoring of risk. Before joining the FAA, Mr. Schnaufer began his career in flight test with the U.S. Navy and recently completed his time as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Test Pilot School. He holds dual master's degrees in aerospace engineering and engineering management from the Florida Institute of Technology and a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University. Our final presenter today will be Mr. Mark Foy. Mr. Foy was appointed Chief Executive and Chief Nuclear Inspector of the United Kingdom's Office for Nuclear Regulation, or ONR, on June 1st of 2021, having been ONR's Chief Nuclear Inspector since 2017. He is an Executive Board Member of the ONR and is the Regulatory Head of the organization, providing independent and authoritative expert advice on nuclear safety, security, and safeguards to the ONR Board, Ministers, and Parliament. Mr. Foy has 35 years of experience of the UK's civil and defense nuclear industry, combined with extensive international experience, having undertaken various senior roles within the international regulatory community. He provides authoritative leadership and insight on nuclear safety and its regulation. Mr. Foy is a chartered fellow of the UK's Nuclear Institute and has an honors degree in mechanical engineering. I look forward to hearing from each of our panelists. Please join me in a welcoming round of applause for them as we bring up the results of the first live polling. And I'm going to apologize. I have to look. <laughs> so looking back over the past year, it looks like we've made progress but still have some work to do to both fully leverage risk-informed decision-making and to communicate our successes and raise awareness of how risk insights are enhancing the NRC's decision-making process. I'm pleased to see the progress we are making incorporating Be Risk Smart into agency culture, and I look forward to the journey continuing. Looking outside of the NRC, could you please bring up the results of the second live polling question? And it looks like the trends are about the same. There is still some road to travel on the journey to create a risk-informed culture broadly. I look forward to hearing from today's panelists about their journey and the lessons learned along the way. With that, let me welcome our first speaker, Mr. Mike Franovich. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, folks. Uh, hope everyone's had their coffee and tea or whatever your beverage is. Welcome to day three of the RIC. Uh, I know it's been a long week, but I, hopefully we have a good conversation today. Uh, we are doing a little different style panel, a few formal remarks perhaps from each of the speakers, so we will not go into great depth. But I do have a few thoughts to share with you all. If I could advance the slides. Okay, uh, let me, uh, first of all, the title of our, pre our session is has the key word in it, trust. So if we go back and think about trust in decision making, and it's something the chairman mentioned in his opening uh, remarks on the first day of the RIC, 
uh, and risk-informed decision-making as sort of the four pillars of a culture and organization that he's striving for. I go back and I think of Stephen Covey's work, the late Stephen Covey, on the speed of trust. And Stephen Covey had a great insights about collaboration. And one of his quotes was, collaboration is the foundation of the standard of living we enjoy today. Trust is the glue. Now that was a statement over 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and it'd be interesting to see if uh, Stephen Covey, what he would think today with our challenges before us as a society. But I think those insights are very pertinent to the type of work that we're doing today. And in his approach, one of the key uh, steps toward building informed trust is to have straight talk. And so in our panel discussion today, I think we're going to be striving for that as a, a outcome. Uh, and so I will be a little bit more direct, perhaps a little less unvarnished. Uh, before I go into details about what we've done over the last year, I do need to set the stage a little bit from an NRC perspective. Some of you are familiar with this and some of you are not. So those of you that are new, I want to spend a few minutes about things that happened about four to five years ago that shape what we're doing today. There were several shaping factors affecting what we do today, but two in particular that were, were quite, quite specific. One was targeted toward the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation in about 2017 to come up with what's called a RITM action plan, an action directed by the commission. And NRR at that time was an office focused on the operating fleet. And so we did develop an action plan to try and build upon the successes that we had in the past, but also deal with the challenges to bake in RITM into our culture. We did accomplish that work. One of the key outcomes was to do more integrated work as a team. Integrated review teams was a key takeaway. And to institutionalize some of our practices and more durable guidance. With that said, at a broader level, agency level, there was a transformation effort also going on. And there were many directives and a commitment by our leadership to do more in the way of becoming a modern risk-informed regulator. And RITM and risk concepts were baked in there. One of the outcomes of that effort was the Be Risk Smart effort. And I need to give uh, acknowledgement to Marilla Gavrilis, who I don't believe is in the room but online today, about all her work to develop with the uh, outstanding team the practices that we use today in the Be Risk Smart framework. But that framework cross-cuts more than nuclear safety. It goes into the things that Andrea Vale spoke to yesterday uh, during the EDO plenary about other areas where we can use risk. So these two actions going on the agency are driving some of the things that you see today. And so what I'm going to share is a few successes in particular. I wanted to set the stage. So first, Be Risk Smart, of course, I've mentioned that. Uh, I'm encouraged. We have shared this uh, activity and the guidance with Be Risk Smart with our stakeholders. And I've actually seen some of our stakeholders use it in the dialogue with the agency. And so it makes a more productive dialogue when we're using a similar framework. Digital INC. Uh, there's been a long road to the treatment of common cause failures, and much progress has been made in the deterministic area. However, there was a huge breakthrough uh, over a year ago when the Commission revised the policy to allow for alternative path using risk insights and the risk approach. We're making progress in that area with Branch Technical Position 719 that is now integrating the thoughts of our risk framework that we use in Regulatory Guide 1174. Uh, and so we're on track to deliver Revision 9 of that Branch Technical Position. Uh, the Commission had some urgency and they said get it done in a year and we are delivering. Uh, turning the topic a little bit to the new reactor fleet, uh, we do, we have been using risk insights uh, for the light water SMR effort and, but could we do a better job? And so we did have an opportunity with the new scale US 460 standard design application that came in to apply risk insights on the front end of the review but target it more to shape the level of review and our resource estimates. So we did that very early on, and, that, and that's an ongoing dialogue because there were refinements in that design and we needed to hear the insights from the vendor about the trade-offs 
on how they were leveraging risk in, in refining that design to help make it more deployable and to improve its safety <coughs> posture. Accident-tolerant fuel increased enrichment rulemaking. Uh, there was a wonderful session on this yesterday. I won't go into to detail about it, but I can tell you that some areas that have had more traditional defense in depth look, such as the treatment of the main control room operator uh, standards for dose and emergency response, we are taking a very hard look at using more risk-informed approaches in that area. And so we've had three productive workshops, actually, in exchanges with the industry to see in in a lot of brainstorming how we can bring these concepts together, just like we did with the branch technical position 719 and digital INC. There's some similarities in thinking there. Risk-informed process, uh, process for evaluations, the, the right process. Uh, there's an example of how we're trying to capitalize on other programs that we've already approved for licensees or processes like integrated decision-making panels that licensees use. This is to drive efficiency in our process, and I'm, I'm pleased to say not only have we approved the first one some time ago, but we have several applications in progress in using, exercising this process. And lastly, I'll note SPAR Dash. The NRC has its own PRA models, as you know, for all the operating plants. We also have some for the new reactor designs. In fact, our latest SPAR model is for the new scale US 460 design. This gives us our independent capability to do some assessments and also not to burden our applicants with some questions that we can handle internally. But we created a dashboard to help promulgate or put out more information to the non-PRA practitioners. That's a huge audience for us where we can actually help enable sharing of risk insights. So those are some of the things I wanted to, to know and we can talk more in the Q&A about it. Uh, so I mentioned that the NRR had a rhythm action plan uh, about five years ago, but that was focused on the, at that time as an office, was before we merged with the new reactor office. And one of the learnings we had is to integrate better, we needed to probably think more about how we can use the NRR rhythm plan and the practices that were in the new reactor office and make more decisions in a conversational dialogue way where we're actually talking about the five principles of risk-informed decision-making as the NRC defines it. At that time, we were also living under direction from the commission in SRM 1936, better known as the New Scale uh, Block Valve SRM, to actually apply risk principles in our decision-making. So here is a tool that we're actually piloting on the new scale review activity. And on what you see on the left side, and its objective is really to, to enhance the dialogue with, amongst the reviewers on the team, to lay out the five principles and actually have folks write down their thoughts. Where are we on these principles? Are we okay? Are there concerns? Or are there some red flags that we really need to focus on? Putting pen to paper, or typing out your thoughts is very helpful in backing up the conversations to say where should we focus? How can we mitigate some of these issues in, in our exchanges with the, the applicant? Ideally, what we could do with this type of approach is roll up the issues and put it into more of a project risk approach where we map out the actual project risks and conformity with the rhythm principles. And that's what you see on the right side. This is a management tool to help us focus on things that might be in the red zone that need much more attention. They may be critical path, there may be safety technical issues that need to be resolved. And so this is another way to sort of reduce the volume of information to something that's very more useful for the management team and the review team working together. And then lastly, I'll go to let me go to the next side. So, mission excellence and being a modern risk-informed regulator, it is a marathon. It is a continuous journey. And we are committed to increase rhythm in our activities. Recognize there are places where we are still need to do more work. I think you see that in the polling results. Uh, 
that's not lost upon me. But positive change management and building on the successes, having the difficult conversations about areas that may not be working to the degree that we would like them to work are, is very important. Also, uh, over time, uh, things that you assume are working well or institutionalized may not be working as well as you think. So we have an effort called Rhythm 2.0 that we're just starting to take a closer look, how well are we implementing these integrated review teams? Some places it's called a core team, some places it's called an interdisciplinary review team, but the bottom line, how are we functioning as a team and integrating and using risk insights and the other principles? It, to us, it's a conversation. It's important to create an environment where we can actually have critical thinking to bring the entire team views together and to make timely decisions. Um, at some point, you do have to make your decision and move on, but it's important that all our, our folks have a voice and a seat at the table and that they, their views are heard and that we learn from each other so we're making better decisions at the end of the day. And with that, I will turn it over to Doug. Great, <clears throat> thanks Mike. And uh, there's certainly a lot going on these days uh, in the risk-informed decision-making area. Uh, I wanna reflect a little bit on kind of the journey we've been on and then it's kind of where we're heading uh, to bring that into this conversation. Um, and so the, my talk is, <coughs> describes this evolving role of risk-informed decision-making. I'm gonna start with uh, the current operating fleet and the progress that we've made over the last, frankly, 40 years uh, of evaluating risk at the operating fleets. Uh, this curve, I think we first made back in 2005, shows the internal events, the average internal events core damage frequency for uh, the operating fleet uh, over the, from since 1992 when the original PRAs were done to today. Uh, we recently had EPRI update this, and for the first time we began to see the influence of flex in the results. Uh, we got another factor of two decrease in the overall internal events uh, core damage frequency from uh, the implementation of flex. Flex, you would note, is, was really oriented towards protecting against uh, the black swan kind of external hazards. Um, but implementation of that and some of the features that were included in that had a direct impact on internal events. We don't have a curve for, um, for the other hazards because we haven't done the studies consistently over that time. Uh, we're looking at whether we can do something similar for fire because I think there's a very similar trend since we started on working on fire in the early 2000s. We broke this into sort of time periods that when you go and look at a, a plant using PRA, it was designed using deterministic methods. There are a lot of insights that come out. Uh, those insights at some plants led to relatively high core damage frequencies that were addressed by those, by those companies. And that led to that early phase of sort of steep reduction in the average. As we moved past the initial IPEs, we went into the maintenance rule and the sort of early phases of risk-informed decision-making, justifying uh, longer AOTs and things. Utilities began to look at how do we understand what this means? How does our performance tie into this? And we saw another period of a downward trend. As we got into the early 2000s, uh, it began more about operational efficiency. Uh, the ROP was, was moving forward. Uh, a lot of focus on how do I establish more margin in the STP process or in, and provide ROP margin. Uh, and so we saw another reduction and then most recently, the implementation of Flex in the mid-teens uh, of uh, uh, 10 years ago or so showed uh, another drop uh, in, the, in the risk. That, that drop's pretty precipitous there in over a one-year period. Uh, that's because the, the uh, updates of the PRAs that occurred all happened to occur in, the, in, the, in that kind of time frame. So we see a significant drop rather than a smooth kind of a drop we saw in some of the other time frames. But I think the industry, I think the NRC for focusing on risk and having us use this as a metric in our regulatory dialogue really deserve a lot of credit for reducing the overall risk by over a factor of 20 using risk-informed methods. That came about 
uh, in, a, in a process where we had largely deterministic methods that we had used to, to set the design basis for the facilities. We brought PRA along, looked at those results, and we made adjustments, and we called that risk-informed. As we look forward to the new, new reactors that are coming, we're sort of flipping the roles of those. And we're starting with a PRA, having a much more prominent role in understanding what the, uh, what the uh, important scenarios are, uh, what equipment's gonna be important, and then adding defense in depth and safety margins in the sort of traditional uh, deterministic considerations on top of that. That turns the process around a little bit and puts us into, and frankly, a new era of risk-informed decision-making. The next slide is an eye chart. I'm not gonna walk through it. It's in the, you can download it if you'd like. The main message of this is that we've had 30 years of, of using PRA for light water reactors. We're quite comfortable with that. We've seen great strides in improving the safety of our reactors. The challenge as we move to advanced reactors is that a lot of what we depended upon as sort of the basis for how we make decisions for the current fleet, large light water reactors, doesn't totally apply as we go forward. The contributors are different. Uh, the, uh, the, the data that underlies it is less, uh, uh, is less deep. Uh, and we just have a lot of new factors we need to bring into the decision-making process. So as we turn this corner and move in the direction of uh, the new plants that are coming, uh, we need to take that into account as we move forward. This is not an argument against moving in this direction. It's just we need to do this with our eyes wide open and understanding the strengths and limitations of PRA because that's what's gotten us that reduction of a factor of 20 in internal events risk, which is highly notable. But we did that with our eyes wide open, understanding the, the tools and what they were telling us. So uh, risk-informed decision-making and then using use of PRA for the operating fleet has been a really valuable regulatory tool and operational tool for the industry. It's helped us focus on safety Risk informing improves safety by focusing on what's important to risk. You focus on the things that are important to the residual that's left over after you've designed and regulated this plant, and that makes the plant safer. It also helps us improve efficiency because we're not wasting resources on things that are less valuable. We're entering into an era here with the operating fleet where we're undertaking a lot of the more ambitious applications of um, 5069, uh, risk-informed completion times. We're, we're taking PRA to a kind of a new level on the plants. I think there's a lot of opportunity for the industry and the NRC to become more un understanding of those approaches. Uh, I think we have a lot of, of training to do on both sides to, to become, become comfortable with that. Uh, and I think there's more opportunity to see that focus on what's important lead us to greater reductions in risk and improvements in safety. Um, as we, as we, what we know today though, may, will change as we move to advanced reactors. And I think it's important that we move into that phase with an understanding of the strengths of PRA, which are many. They're very, it's a very valuable tool, but also its limitations. And as we enter into this era, we do that and don't let our technical hubris for thinking we know more than we know influence where we end up because we need to, we need to use this tool within its limits and, and uh, make sure that we apply our risk-informed, overall risk-informed thinking process that Mike laid out, the five principles, in a, in a um, consistent manner. With that, I'll turn it over to Cody. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my slide is a little bit less technical, a bit more uh, perspective and context. Okay, I might be asking yourself, why is somebody from the FAA here, right? So uh, completely different industries, uh, but the, the framework and the thought process uh, is exactly the same. In fact, uh, as we look to grow our risk-informed capabilities, both internally to the agency and uh, in the industry we oversee, we, we often look at the nuclear industry. Um, the, 
right, the risk tolerance of the general public is very similar. Um, the ability to uh, keep pace with the growing industry is another challenge that both the uh, NRC and the FAA have in common, uh, and there's a lot of lessons learned we can get from each other. So uh, just a couple thoughts for context. Uh, I am uh, a member of the Flight Standards Service within the FAA. That's relevant in the sense that we are the second largest component of the FAA outside of the air traffic controllers. So they're about half of the FAA. You take them out, we're the next biggest part of the organization. Uh, we are in the aviation safety world. Uh, we are responsible for oversight of air carriers, airmen, uh, mechanics, all of those things. So we have embraced, uh, as I say on the slide there, a risk uh, informed decision making. Uh, when I say embrace, what I really mean is um, we are scaling up how we do this. Risk informed thought process has always been a part of aviation. It goes back to kind of the earliest days of aviation training. Uh, if somebody's going out to get their private pilot's license right now, the first thing they'll do with their instructors, they'll walk around the airplane, look at everything, examine the various parts. Uh, they'll look at the weather, they'll plan their flight, and then they'll make a decision based on those factors on do we fly, do we not fly. So that's something inherent in our industry and the way we operate. Uh, and now it's really about taking that and being able to scale that up to the, the larger organizational enterprise type issues. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the growing industry, but uh, if you uh, have even a, a passing knowledge of the changes going on in the aviation industry, they're huge, right? We've got commercial space flight, we've got uh, urban air mobility is a big growth area. Uh, drones, unmanned systems have been for the last 10 years or so a, a booming industry. Uh, with a lot of value and a lot of ability to uh, actually do things safer, right? The, the idea in the drone world of taking a drone, having that fly in a grid pattern over a field uh, is inherently safer than having somebody in a crop duster. Uh, they're able to do it lower, more control, uh, but it's different. And that's the part that uh, as a regulator we are trying to keep pace with is understanding those changes. And like Doug said, it's really about being able to apply our resources to those areas of highest risk. Uh, just a couple other notes. Yeah, it's an administrator level uh, strategic objective to, uh, we call it risk based decision making. I actually like the term risk informed a little bit better. I think it uh, better encapsulates what we're really after. Um, we have looked into our rulemaking, our certification, both to apply to the areas of highest risk, but also look at how do we do our regulations uh, with a changing industry and what's the best way to do that. So, looking at things like performance based regulations, understanding that it's about uh, attaining a certain level of safety rather than very prescriptive in how you attain that. Uh, and then our oversight. So there's a, a couple things there that I should have spelled out. Uh, SAS, RPAT, BSRP, and ASAP. So uh, what those are just various programs we have as an agency to collect data and to use that data to make those risk informed decisions. So uh, SAS, SAS is our safety assurance system. We look across all the operators uh, from you know, the, the big carriers that you're familiar with down to the little mom and pop. Uh, crop dusting shops, collect that information and look for those systemic trends of what's working well and what isn't. Uh, RPAD is just another tool that's a uh, risk-based ability to target our resources so we have this data about an operator. Uh, we as a government agency have a finite number of folks so how do we best apply those resources to make sure we're looking at those areas of highest risk while also uh, keeping an eye on those smaller operators. Those might not be the ones that jump out, but they operate a lot more, uh, and it's a different level of risk. We actually uh, talk about it as a safety continuum. So at one end, you have the commercial flights, the, the one I, I flew here yesterday. So uh, right, that world is a huge part. That's what the public really looks at. But how do we scale that safety, and how do we scale our regulations down to you know, that 16, 17-year-old student pilot who is about to do their first solo flight? Uh, and then the last two, those are uh, big, uh, I don't have a, a fancy chart like Doug, but big game changers in the aviation industry are actually voluntary reporting. Um, one of the biggest drivers we saw coming out of the, the 1970s and 1980s was um, by taking a less adversarial oversight approach and a more open um, non-reprisal type approach, we're able to get more information of things that weren't going well. Right, times when uh, someone didn't follow a procedure or times when 
uh, things didn't always go according to plan. Previously in the industry, that was the kind of thing you kept very quiet, uh, you didn't share. We have made a 180 degree turn with our industry. We're very open. Uh, most of the information that is reported, it'll be de-identified, but it's available to the general public. NASA does a great job of putting out the uh, information on aviation safety incidents. Uh, and we've really reoriented that to let's share the information. As a regulator, we're not going to see everything, so let's work together to identify those areas of highest risk. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Cody. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be here this morning to share with you our journey on risk-informed targeted regulation in the United Kingdom. As the UK's nuclear regulator, ONR has considered itself a risk-informed regulator for many years, actually over many decades, so it's not new to us. Operating within a performance-based goal-setting regime allows us to regulate on a sampling basis, which we do seek to undertake in a targeted and proportionate way in relation to risk. Our legal and regulatory framework is clear that licensees and duty holders are the ones that are required to manage and control the risks that their acti activities actually give rise to. Over the last few years, stakeholder feedback and internal assurance reviews within our own organisation have highlighted potential challenges with our application of a risk-informed approach. It's been a revealing insight for us, hence we've embarked on right our risk-informed targeted engagement initiative just over a year ago. There are a range of considerations associated with the risk-informed approach, and for the UK this includes the health and safety law within the UK requires risk to be reduced so far as it is reasonably practicable. Consequently, risk has always been a factor in ONR and in its decision-making, but we've not been consistent in how we deploy our resources and focus our regulatory attention. A key factor also is that the level of knowledge and experience of inspectors within the Office for Nuclear Regulation has changed over years. Our demographic is changing and our inspectorate now has less experience. In addition, we need to look at the environment. A resource now needs to be deployed across the existing facilities, some of which are seeking lifetime extensions, but we're now also having new areas uh, that we've got to regulate uh, in uh, an increasingly ambitious nuclear sector. So that's a broader portfolio for our regulation, which is reflecting the UK's strategic priorities. Our right approach will allow us to prioritise consistently across our safety, security, safeguards and transport regulatory purposes, but also enable individual inspectors to properly target their attention and allocation of time, meeting the demands of the sector but regulating effectively. Right will ensure we target effort primarily on those activities that give rise to the most serious risks, where the hazards or the vulnerabilities are least well controlled or where ongoing compliance with the law needs to be established. It also considers how we behave as a regulator, how we interact and collaborate with each other within the organisation, so that our overall approach and decisions across each one of our regular purposes or areas of focus is consistently risk informed. Key is deploying our highly skilled and experienced but limited regulatory staff in an efficient manner. Importantly, our inspectors, as part of the right initiative, will be supported throughout with effective coaching and tools to help them use risk insights effectively when deciding how we utilise our resource. Right requires anything that we will do as a regulatory body to be anchored in one or more of three underpinning pillars of risk-informed regulation, regardless of whether it's about nuclear safety, security or safeguards, transport or indeed industrial safety, which we regulate. Those are what we term our five regulatory purpose and they've been considered, sep they've been considered separately in the organisation up until now. The three pillars are in relation to the potential for harm. Secondly, how well the hazard and risk is actually controlled, the robustness of the engineering, human factors contributions and the organisational maturity of the duty holder. It will also consider intelligence-led decisions, utilising the experience we have as a regulator on the licensee's previous performance. The approach will consider the different ways risk can manifest across the industry that we regulate 
and it will be evidenced and we will consider that evidence in risk assessments, safety cases, security plans and safeguard cases as well. Prioritising our strategies, plans and resource deployment, balancing those competing requirements across a diverse nuclear estate in the United Kingdom, while still in tune we regulate activities in a way that support those that we regulate not only to comply but also meet their own ambitions. We will be publishing our right guidance document in early October. This has been developed, as I say, over the last 12 months. But we also recognise it's not just about guidance. It's a cultural implementation in the organisation. And that is a much longer agenda than just publishing the document next month. That cultural challenge of embedding this in the fabric of ONR and the mindset of our inspectors is a significant one and will require ongoing commitment across our leadership and at all levels in the organisation. But as part of that implementation, we'll be looking to embed right coaches in the organisation, provide structured training and co coaching, which I've already identified, but we're going to develop risk profiles for the sites that we regulate that will consider all aspects of the purposes. Also enhancing our processes and guidance, but again another important factor is establishing metrics to monitor and measure the impact of the approach on the organisation and its success. So just to conclude, risk informed regulation must be adopted to guide our decision making. As I said before, it improves safety, it promotes efficiency while still ensuring effective regulation of the nuclear industry. We have to bound the regulatory work appropriately. We cannot consider everything, nor should we be expected to. A risk-informed approach avoids undue burden on industry and regulatory bodies. It allows for time review of submissions and targeted regulatory scrutiny and approvals, while also enabling appropriately informed regulatory retention and decisions that demonstrably assure safe and secure operations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to all of our panelists. I'd appreciate if we could bring up the third live polling question on the screen. Here we go. So to respond, uh, again, please go to the polls tab on the virtual conference platform or text the code <coughs> shown on the screen. Our response options are somewhat limited in the live polling format, but I look forward to your thoughts on what is most needed to support a culture that embraces risk-informed decision-making. We've heard some great ideas from the panelists, and I look forward to engaging more directly on this question in our panel discussion. This question is intended to gain some insights from you, our audience, today on the focus areas and tools that you believe would be most beneficial. Hopefully, everyone is able to go ahead and weigh in. It looks like our results are coming up. And I see a lot of support for the positive change management initiatives. I think that's uh, certainly, you know, trying to move our culture. That's a critical element. Um, I hope the panel can reflect on those results and incorporate them into our panel discussion, and I guess we can move right into it. So my first question for the panel, to make risk-informed decision-making truly a part of organizational culture, you have to bring all of the people in your organization along on the journey. What best practices have you identified to build organizational support for risk-informed decision-making? I think, Mark, you just were mentioning the steps you guys are taking. If you'd like to go ahead and start. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's a reinforcement of what I was just saying uh, a second ago. Senior leaders in the organisation have to be strong advocates and visible within the organisation, supportive of uh, a risk-informed approach. It's no point your leadership um, offering different views, perhaps undermining that approach, and they then work with their own teams to make sure that the teams beneath them understand why a risk-informed approach is important, and then that should hopefully cascade and manifest itself throughout the organisation. That's one of the learning curves for us uh, in the UK. Um, some of the feedback we have got from uh, stakeholder surveys that we've undertaken has given us uh, some questions around our proportionality in relation to targeting our effort. And when we've actually peeled back the cover, 
the feedback has been that the senior leadership and the management are espousing the risk-informed approach, but it's not always put into practice at lower levels in the organisation. So it needs to be identified where those areas are, try and understand why that's the case, but then work with them to get them onto the same page of adopting that risk-informed approach. Thank you. So more broadly to the panel, I think that really raises what is the role of leadership in driving risk-informed decision-making within your organizations? Any takers? I'll take a uh, whack at it. Um, so I, I think Mark is definitely uh, right on when he says it's got to be a top-down driven and then that cascading is really important. Uh, in an organization as uh, complex as ours and sometimes compartmentalized, uh, there are significant disconnects sometimes between maybe not the intent of that message but the words being used that it's not readily apparent that we're all saying the same thing. Uh, one of the, the greatest benefits we have in our agency is we have a very dedicated, a very mission-focused workforce. Uh, you could ask anyone that works for the FAA and they will tell you our mission is to ensure the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world. Uh, they don't need to think about it, they are ready to do that. Where that becomes a hindrance sometimes though is uh, we have established the safest aerospace system in the world, so the question becomes why would we do things differently? Right? If I change the way I do my day-to-day -day job, am I maintaining that level of safety? Uh, and that is where the role of leaders is really important to help, um, first off, acknowledge that that's a huge driver and it's an important part of it, but to really tie our messaging into that larger mission. Uh, and we have, uh, quite honestly, this is a growth area for us. Uh, as leaders, we haven't always done a great job of making the, that connection for our folks of, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, what we did got us to this point. Here is why we need to change. So that why is a huge part of it. Um, and really, for us, it's the changing industry, it's the new technologies, and we need to be able to do things differently to keep that level of safety we've already attained. So it's the, uh, uh, the book title is uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. So that's really part of the mindset for us of to continue being the safest in the, in the world, we need to do something different. Uh, and like Mark said, that definitely has to be driven top down, has to be a consistent message throughout the organization. Thanks so much, Cody. Mike or Doug, any additional thoughts you'd like to add? I, I think I'll throw in something. Um, <clears throat> I think there's sometimes a misconception that safety and compliance and risk are different things. And, I, and I'm not sure leadership, um, this is something that came to me late in my career, uh, is, unless your leadership always makes that un, makes that connection, that actually they're just two sides of the same coin. That risk is giving you an indication of what the residual risk is after you've complied and after you've demonstrated you are meeting requirements. Understanding that residual is valuable on both sides. It helps you understand if there's a non-compliance, how big a deal was it? Was it big or little? If it, it helps you understand if I want to reduce that residual, what are the contributors to that and what additional things could I do? And I think too often we've allowed this idea that there are kind of different ways to do safety um, be uh, pervasive in the, in the organization. And, and actually they're totally connected. And we couldn't do PRA without the deterministic basis or a deterministic basis. And we couldn't do, we wouldn't be sure we were safe as we found when we did the IPEs. We wouldn't be sure we were safe without having that understanding of where that residual risk resides. So I think, think doing a better job, what, I, what I've found in trying to communicate this uh, is to connect those. And then that helps explain why being risk informed improves safety because you're looking at what that residual is at the end of the day. So, a lot of great, great thoughts, a lot to work with. Uh, commitment from leadership is that that's essential. Um, proclamations, statements, objectives it doesn't translate into change. It doesn't happen by osmosis. 
It requires this continuous dialogue and engagement with leaders at all levels. And so very much what Mark was saying, it's that reinforcement of that expectation uh, that we hold each, out, each of us accountable to that commitment. And that's just not senior leaders. Again, it's throughout an entire organization. But on the ground level, there's also um, a different perspective that we have to, and that we've been very sensitive to, and that is that we don't create a mindset of its risk versus the traditional engineering. They, they are blended together and respecting that the traditional engineering approaches are reflected in the risk assessments. Uh, this is something that, that is a little bit of a mystique about risk, that it's somehow a statistical, just a statistical approach, and it's, it's far more than that. If you look at the information that undergirds risk assessments, a lot of the engineering analyses done for the plants are part of that suite of information that is reflected in the results. And the other part I would say is that the conversation piece is there, um, what we've learned and what we conducted what were called risk cafes to actually outreach to the various communities about how they perceived risk, how they felt about um, what the messages were coming down regarding applying risk and tools Guidance were very important to develop, but also a reflection that risk is more than a quantitative uh, effort, which is very important, but there are also qualitative aspects to it, which is part of traditional engineering. So bringing those together and making sure that folks are heard is, was one of the key takeaways for us organizationally. Thanks. I really appreciate the insights from, from the panel. That was very, uh, very informative. And, you know, next I'd sort of like to hone in on an area that has had a lot of discussion at the, this week's RIC. For the development of advanced reactors and new designs within the nuclear industry, there has been a focus on international collaboration and seeking more uniformity in regulatory requirements across different countries. Uh, do you have any insights on how those trends may benefit from or impact risk-informed decision-making? Doug, or certainly Mark, thank you. Yeah. Given that we've just signed the agreement with the CNSC and the NRC, I think it would be quite appropriate for me to comment. Uh, <clears throat> I think international collaboration and the benefits of it um, are really clear um, in terms of um, improved efficiencies but also in terms of learning and sharing across the various collaborative parties. Um, and you end up then, I believe, having more timely evaluations of new technologies. But the cooperation at the moment is very much centered on light water reactors. I think one of the speakers said earlier about advanced nuclear technologies, they are less well defined. Uh, there's lots of claims on their performance and the levels of safety. That needs examination, and I think that collaboration across international boundaries is essential to get a consistent but certain picture for the industry about how their technologies will be received. That shift towards passive safety systems, new and novel technologies and such like, will lead a shift in the emphasis on the analysis, validation and verification that will be required beyond those in traditional engineering substantiations today. I oh, appreciate it, Mark, because another vantage point is when you look at, and the themes of the RIC regarding adaptiveness, uh, and the demands on looking at advanced reactors, new reactors, and, and sustaining the light water fleet, you quickly realize uh, to meet all these expectations in a timely manner is you don't have all the resources you would like to have. Uh, something that Cody mentioned specifically about, about how you do resource management. And so the international collaboration affords us that opportunity in these pockets of expertise that are needed to actually take, take the opportunity there to, to reach out and learn from each other. And not just learn, but there are organizationally at times potential for blind spots. So having another regulator uh, working with them sometimes does reveal things that may have been missed, and we've had a few examples of that. So it's a, it's a more 
efficient way if it's done in a, in a, a scale like we talked about with the trilateral agreement. Uh, and then also just targeting which sets of experts you could leverage to really get those additional insights because there are some, some areas of expertise you simply cannot uh, go out and hire suddenly and have an instant transformation to not only have the knowledge but experience that goes with it. So it is a, it is a very optimized kind of way of doing work. I'll just jump in uh, briefly to say I think that uh, the way that the this trilateral arrangement has been set up is, is smart. I think that um, a lot of people talk about harmonization of regulation worldwide. I think that's a you know, nirvana maybe, but I don't see it's being very particularly practical. I think the collaborating and and using the resources and and reducing the amount of re-review on it, focused is a much better way to proceed. And and I think that um, that Mark and uh, and the NRC and CNSC really deserve to be uh, congratulated for a, a thoughtful approach to move us down that road. Someday we may get to more true harmonization with a lowercase h, but but I think that um, this co this collaboration thing is, is really good. And I think um, uh, the risk and bringing risk informing into that will be, I think, a learning experience for everybody. So. Just one additional point uh, in top of what Doug has said there. I think the view of myself, of Chair Hansen and President Jamal, is that from small acorns you grow large oak trees. So this initial collaboration was between the US and Canada. It now involves the UK. The intention in the future is the collaboration go beyond those three parties and involve other regulators and indeed other vendors of technologies as well. Thank you all. And I, I think, you know, the, the benefits of, of that cooperation, you know, go way beyond just the initial projects that we work on, but really building that community is so important for us. Um, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, su some successes of implementation of risk-informed decision-making and the importance of leaders. Um, I think there's also a real importance to those first followers in an organization and having that uh, sort of building momentum. But there always do seem to be some pockets of resistance. And so reflecting on the, uh, you know, the how risk-informed decision-making, the journey within your own organizations, what activities have your organizations taken to try and reach those sort of folks who aren't convinced? What do you think? So I'll go first on this one. Um, Kind of similar to my earlier comments about the, the strength of our mission focus, um, that does lend itself to those pockets of resistance. And I wish I could sit here and say, we had it all figured out and here's the answers and you follow you know, nice step by step uh, and everyone will get on board. Uh, I can't, it is a growth area for us. Um, but I also think um, those pockets of resistance can be looked at as an advantage in some ways uh, if you uh, work with those folks in the right way. Uh, I am a big fan of uh, diversity, particularly diversity of thought. Uh, I saw a TED talk recently, they talked about it from an economic standpoint. Uh, they've proven statistically that you get better decisions the more diverse thought you have in the room. Uh, right? People coming from different perspectives. So uh, those pockets of resistance, there are reasons that they resist. There are reasons that they see it different. And being able to leverage that, and uh, we use the term joint design uh, within the agency, bringing them in to help understand what their concerns are and try to make a better product. Uh, whether that is a regulation, whether that is our risk-informed decision-making, that's a, a cultural thought we have. Uh, I think the other important part of trying to approach uh, kind of quote-unquote pockets of resistance is really knowing your workforce. For us, we've got uh, a huge array of backgrounds that come into the agency, right? We've got air traffic controllers, we've got engineers, flight standards, we're mostly pilots and mechanics. And they all have their own set of cultural norms, their own things that they bring with them, their own way of looking at the world. So part of it as leaders is understanding that uh, if I'm gonna go talk to engineers or I'm gonna talk to pilots, it's a very different conversation, right? The pilot mechanic world tends to be very 
process driven, process oriented, what's my checklist, what steps do I follow, I know this is safe. So trying to do that differently, there's a lot of concern where our engineering workforce uh, tends to be a little more open to doing that. The, the flip side of the coin for them is um, they're all very smart and they have their own way of doing it. So trying to get consensus around this is the way collectively we're going to do it. So uh, those are just a, a couple thoughts, things to keep in mind. Like I said, I don't have all the answers, but uh, I would just say reorient that and rather than look at it as pockets of resistance, those are pockets of information that you need to tap into. So uh, initially, uh, uh, similar to Cody there, the opportunity is to bring uh, mixed groups of individuals together within your organization and have discussions. Uh, look to dispel myths that people may have about adopting uh, a risk-informed approach, but also, as Cody has said, try and understand the diverse views. Some of them will be important and will be valuable, so you need to listen and hear what is being said. But also the importance of using peer influence to get that mind, uh, mindset changed. But also you could work with your staff to empower them to support what good looks like in terms of risk-informed decision-making and use them as conduits into your organization. But what I would say is ultimately you're going to have to tackle the issue head-on where risk-informed approaches aren't being adopted and that is what you have decided as an organization. Um, it's in some instances views being expressed where well we've always done it this way we're going to continue doing it this way, and that shouldn't always prevail at all. You have to have a growth mindset and be a learning organization. Uh, so I had just a few thoughts. So we, outreach was very important for us in our Rhythm Action Plan, uh, as well as in the Be Risk Smart framework. One takeaway we had was in order to be have a more inclusive approach, there's a perception that training is is important, but it's more of being told what to do in, in a one-way communication, and that a more um, complementary approach would be to have forums where you have open discussion. And we have sponsored several forums internally uh, in the NRC, as well as we had one last fall externally to hear from not just the nuclear sector, but we also had the FAA, we had NASA, because risk and risk management permeates so many high-tech industries. Uh, but to hear the different strategies and approaches, and not just PRA folks talking to each other, because there's actually a larger community that you need to have the conversation with, that is just one constituency. Uh, and so we found forums are, uh, we usually get very high attendance in forums. When you have something more of a dialogue and perspective exchange, that, that seems to be a very healthy approach to, to getting an airing of views and getting more buy-in into a, an approach that's, that people can see their work is reflected in the ultimate decisions that are made. Thanks, Mike. And noting the time, I think we can shift into some of our audience Q&A. And, um, you know, Mike, this first question is really for you and sort of builds upon the discussion we were just having. Risk-informed decision-making requires some amount of evidence, experience, and expertise to be effectively implemented. How do you view the dichotomy between new and dynamic nature of the advanced reactor industry and the desire to have enough information to implement risk-informed decision-making? Well, I could go back to, uh, Doug had actually, I think his framework laid out a number of areas where if you don't have enough operating experience, how do you build a bridge to address that gap uh, what I like to say in the new reactors, and maybe a little in advanced reactors, I work mostly in the new reactors, which in the NRC lingo is more of the light water advanced designs, uh, advanced passive designs, water-cooled SMRs. So you can have a risk assessment that's aspirational from a design PRA standpoint, but understand that it's aspirational. In other words, it can be built on information from operating experience that is available, and it can have uncertainty associated with that's reflected in the risk assessment based on the data that's available. Uh, 
on the other hand, what's the story behind making those estimates come true? They're estimates. They're the design PRAs are used to help provide insights, not only with the vendor itself, but also the regulator. But there has to be a story, a framework that surrounds the making those target estimates come true. Because the programs are not going to be like the traditional uh, plants have today. And that's what a lot of data are built around the, those traditional programs. So if you're using more non-safety related equipment, that we, of course we have policies and programs and approaches that address that, but what is the proposal from the applicant that will help sustain that more aspirational target values? And so it takes a, a very comprehensive type of approach that looks at things, everything from product development to qualification to testing, initial tests, uh, and then the controlling measures on availability, reliability, and quality uh, in a different way than the traditional, traditional fleet has actually experienced. So it's the story that's behind the estimates in part. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, our next question from the audience is really looking back a, a little bit. Um, so, Doug, regarding your portrayal of risk over time, how is industry managing factors that would tend to increase risk over time, such as aging, structure systems and components, or licensed operator demographics? For example, replacement of experienced operators with inexperienced new operators uh, within the current fleet. Well, I mean, obviously there are aging management programs that were, are put in place as the plants age to monitor those passive systems that aren't uh, being uh, uh, tested and, and, uh, and uh, refurbished through the course of the life of the, of the plant. And, and monitoring that, I th uh, and as as plants uh, update their PRAs periodically, they they look to information they've learned to feed that back into the process. I think the human uh, side of things is is a trickier one. I think that um, uh, you know we have methods for assessing human performance and translating that into the PRA use. Um, every operator that comes in is well trained, uh, and uh, I think that is a foundation for those methods. Um, and I don't know that we have seen uh, evidence that um, that there are gaps in that training that would cause us to think that performance is as degraded. Certainly, experience uh, in the in the moment uh, is beneficial. But that's not really kind of the way that the, the risk assessment is, is founded. It's more based on the what are the expectations for the knowledge and training and procedures for the operator. Thanks. We have a question um, for you, uh, Cody. Um, you talked about the shift in oversight approach at FAA from one of reprisal to open exchange of information. How did you effectively lead this cultural change within FAA to address concerns regarding reducing independent oversight? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, it was not an easy process. It was not a quick process. Uh, I came into the agency in 2014. Uh, here we are 10 years later and we're still on that journey. Um, one of the right one of the biggest concerns culturally was that here's how we've always done it uh why would this be any better and it's really about uh, one reorienting the conversation to why now why do we need to do something different but also getting enough traction so you can start seeing results from that to be able to right it goes from in theory this will be better because to based on this data, we are showing an increase. Um, particularly what does resonate with our workforce is um, it's not about doing less oversight. It's about, as an individual inspector, you may be doing the same amount of oversight you've always done, but it's about targeting it appropriately uh, because we don't, uh, it's not that we don't have as many inspectors as we used to, it's that the, the industry has grown 
significantly and trying to keep pace as a, as a federal organization, we just can't operate the way we always have. So the big thing to help with the cultural shift was really getting enough of that in practice and showing that we were making improvements that we were safer. The other thing that really helped with that is uh, from an enforcement standpoint, if someone's not complying, to go through that process is a very long process, right? It involves legal, it involves the courts. Uh, so that could drag out for years where the idea behind the compliance philosophy is, okay, here is something that's not compliant. What is your plan to get back on track, to get back into compliance? And uh, while it's not quite voluntary, it is a lot more flexible, a lot more cooperative in how do we get there. So rather than uh, in the enforcement days, a lot of uh, I'm going to appeal this, so I'm not going to change anything until the appeal goes through, we're able to more rapidly make changes to uh, make changes with our operators to get them back into compliance. Mark? Yeah, just on that theme and that open exchange of information, the comment I'll make in a second stands fast for uh, the question earlier on around advanced nuclear technology, advanced nuclear technologies and the maturity of the designs and aspirations that Mike was highlighting, but also in relation to ageing and the impacts on risk management. There should be an open exchange of information between uh, the industry and regulators as a matter of course. There shouldn't be any hindrance to that at all. In the United Kingdom, as a regulator, I spoke on a panel yesterday about the enabling regulatory approach that we adopt in the United Kingdom. And that's about working with the industry. Uh, I don't shy away from using the terms of cooperation and collaboration to achieve the outcomes at the end of the day. Those outcomes have got to be achieved safely and securely, but you can work together in achieving those. So that exchange of information has got to happen. There shouldn't be any surprises, uh, and you should be working on uh, considering the challenges together in a mutually respectful relationship. That's what's got to pervade. Otherwise, my view is you're not um, succeeding in working effectively and efficiently, either as an industry or as a regulator in coming together. Just a, l a last thought, just reflecting on Cody and Mark's uh, <laughs> comment. We, as, as some of you know, lived through a transformational changing episode in the history of our agency, uh, thanks to Congress, uh, and looking at a different way of doing our inspection program and the reactor oversight process. And the key takeaway there is a, a collaborative stakeholder approach, not just with industry, Actually, it was a fascinating approach that some of you still recall, may recall, we used a federal advisory committee uh, that also included some of the non-government organizations that had a more, um, I would say, more uh, focused uh, concern about safety. And they were included on the actual FACA panel that uh, helped roll out, develop and roll out our over oversight process, which is actually technically a voluntary program. And that, because there was buy-in, we were able to obtain a process that helped with free flow of exchange of information, a whole suite of new performance indicators, uh, but also to help stabilize what at that time was viewed largely as an inconsistently applied uh, enforcement approach, uh, compliance-based approach. So that we have lessons from the past that we can leverage moving forward in that sort of more open exchange uh, and have a more stakeholder, all stakeholder viewpoint approach to these newer technologies. Thanks, Mike. And I'll, uh, we'll just keep the mic moving here because this next question is directed to you, but I, I'm sure others on our panel will want to also weigh in. So the question, how do we best bring together the range of probabilistic and qualitative risk insights to help decision making, particularly where the probabilistic element is less mature? Okay, uh, well, it's uh, certainly not one magic formula. Uh, it's case by case, in my, my opinion. You do have to look, in, from our perspective, from the rhythm principles, how much margins, defense in depth, uh, perhaps taking more of a performance-based approach uh, in terms of trying to, to come up with the ultimate outcome. So if you don't have that much 
information available to support the, the quantitative piece, they are compensatory type of approaches you can take. Uh, if you're going to lean more to newer technology, trying to leverage more of a, of a, a probabilistic quantitative approach. Uh, this is, goes back to the topic of uncertainties, so looking at margins and things like that. So there are offsets that you'd have to have on a case-by-case -case kind of evaluation, but looking at those sort of pillars uh, does help make a more sound decision at the end of the day. That's another thing I'd add is that <clears throat> the if, we're, if you're talking about a situation where there is PRA information and may not be perfect, other qualitative considerations. There's a lot more in the PRA model than just the number that comes out of it. A lot of times we like to boil this down to, oh, it's X point Y times 10 to the minus whatever, and say that's good or bad. And uh, the models actually can give you a lot more context for helping make the decision, understanding the scenarios that are involved, understanding the connected system or human actions that are involved, and actually using that can help you interpret some of the qualitative information in a better way, not using the numbers, but understanding how the, uh, the qualitative considerations actually fit into the bigger safety picture because PRA gives the integrated view of the plant that we don't get through most other technically uh, stovepipe sort of oriented views that we take to nuclear <coughs> safety. So I think digging in a little bit beyond just the, the number that comes out of any risk assessment is, is essential. And uh, I think we need to, to, to do that in those cases. Thank you. Well, let me, uh, I, I have to, to tell you, Cody, while our industries are very different, the, uh, the ability to gain insights from another regulator is just sparking a lot of questions here. So I'm going to, uh, sort of consolidate a couple, but these are focused for you, Cody. Um, the, the first is really about, you know, is there a cautionary tale in over-reliance on risk in regulatory decision-making? The, uh, there are some examples, uh, most recently, I think the 737 MAX, it was a high-profile story in the news, um, but we're interested in, you know, your thoughts on the role of the FAA and the risk-based oversight uh, that FAA performs. So as I gather my thoughts on that, I think there is, there is an assumption in that question um, that the, the certification of any particular aircraft uh, or certification of a new operator uh, is done solely based on risk. It, it's not. Uh, really where the risk informed piece comes in uh, is in our, uh, we, can ca we call it continual operational safety. So something is fielded, it is out there, and now it is how do we best manage our resources to look at those things, to look for emerging issues, to uh, like to say be preventative, uh, but a lot of our oversight really is driven based on data, so it's a little bit more reactionary. Uh, that is one of our goals to grow into more proactive and then maybe even predictive as the data systems mature. But from uh, a certification standpoint, that's actually one of the areas we've identified as highest risk. So uh, whether it is a new uh, private jet, a large transport carrier, uh, a helicopter for emergency medical services. Uh, those regulations are uh, set based on uh, achieving safety in the NAS and complying with those. It, it, we don't pick and choose, so to speak. Uh, it is an across the board, you need to comply with all of these uh, type of regulations. Um, so I, I think it's less about um, sorry, can you repeat the question again? I want to make sure I address it appropriately. I think the question was really, you know, how uh, it was a, you know, are there any cautionary thoughts about over-reliance on risk and um, how it's applied in, in your programs? Yeah, so, so if I kind of decouple that now to the world where we really do focus on that risk-based approach, are there any cautionary tales? 
Um, I think the biggest thing would be kind of to the previous question. If we were to disregard some of those qualitative things, like we have some inspectors who have 20 years of experience at an operator or in the industry, now 20 years experience in the agency, that's 40 years of experience. And if we try to boil it down to, right, this is the number, the number says go look here and not rely on um, their experience. I heard somebody say once kind of that gut reaction, that instinct isn't, uh, is actually one of the most data driven things we as uh, humans do. It's usually unconscious. There's something in our experience that's raising that concern. So by being able to take advantage of that experience as we're doing oversight to look at things that we may not have been driven towards with the numbers. Uh, so I don't know that's a cautionary tale, but that would be the concern for me is if we stopped relying on that and went strictly to here are what the numbers say. Go on, Mike. Oh. I, I was just going to uh, build on what Cody said and add also what some of you may not be aware of. There's a great deal of exchange of information going on amongst uh, FAA, NASA, and NRC, actually through the National Academy of Sciences. And there was a mandate to actually help um, update uh, their risk manual and techniques and methods. So there's a, been a healthy exchange and set of recommendations that came out of the National Academies that actually uh, there's actually a board of, uh, of experts, of consultants that are uh, assisting and providing perspectives to the FAA to help build upon their experiences and their recommendations. So some, I see one or two out, out there that are, are we like, like me on the, on the board of consultants. To, uh, to assist, but these exchanges help under, you know, we understand that what, for example, one takeaway I learned is there's a lot of data FAA collects. It has tremendous uh, banks of information on pilot performance, software issues, um, but perhaps areas of the techniques used in risk assessment are a little different. And uh, whereas in the nuclear industry, maybe we have, we have a lot of data, but perhaps not so much in the operator or human performance area. So it's been a very eye-opening experience, but there is a very good exchange going on. So the, the takeaway for us is the learnings amongst the different agencies that have very similar types of regulatory uh, functions. Just a couple of short comments from myself. <clears throat> what we're asking our regulators, our inspectors to do is to make a judgment at the end of the day. and. I think most of us on the panel have said risk-informed decision-making, so it is risk-informed. We have to take a holistic view. Um, the risk analysis helps to inform where you target your effort, but you have to look at the overall design and what is contributing in that aspect. So it's about being risk-informed, not overly driven. Thank you. And in our last couple of minutes here. I, I think this question, is a, it's a little bit of a shift, but I would really love hearing from all of the panel members if you'd like to. So the question is really about what would be your suggestions for moving an organization forward once a decision is made that not everyone agrees with? <laughs> Just an easy one to wrap us up here. <laughs> Send it to the boss. <laughs> Correct, yes. No, I, I think from my perspective, you've got to keep working on it. Um, if there is a disagreement, there will be a reason why there is a disagreement, but at the end of the day, you've got to make a decision. And joking aside, the ultimate decision maker in my organization is me. So we have a, a framework, arrangements for uh, trying to deal with any particular conflict in a regulatory decision. But, uh, as I say, if you can't come to an agreement, and it will mean that potentially someone is upset at the end of the day, you've got to make a decision. It's the best interest of you as a regulator, but also the industry with you regulate. Cody, do you have any thoughts from FAA's experience? Um, well, I think Mark's answer was fantastic. I, I think... <laughs> uh, I mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot of space, a lot that can be learned from uh, incorporating those dissenting voices uh, and revising or reconsidering certain things. But at some point, a decision has been made and uh, in an industry that changes 
as quickly as ours, uh, doing nothing is a decision, but uh, it's not necessarily an intentional decision. So that's the one we want to avoid. There are reasons to do things differently, reasons to change, and those should be informed. Um, but once the decision is, the, is made, there is that need to go forward. It does need to be that top-down uh, driven approach, especially our organization. Uh, we are so diverse that if it is not that unified message, those pockets of resistance continue to um, exist. They continue to be a part of it. So um, I think the other thing is uh, transparency, I think is really important being able to show, right, we are getting better. This is achieving the intended result. That's something as a, uh, an organization we necessarily haven't always been great at. Traditionally, it's right, we put a regulation in place to prevent this thing. And as long as that thing doesn't happen again, we assume everything's working great. So that is a growth area for us is really trying to understand why we make a decision, why we change course, and establishing some kind of criteria with which we can evaluate ourselves. So being transparent with that, what's going well, where there are growth areas, uh, I think is a, is a huge part of getting people to come along. But at the end of the day, like Mark said, um, that is the, uh, the role of leaders in an organization to set the direction, to make informed decisions, uh, but then to drive the change. Cody? Doug, you, you lead a, a different diverse set of yeah. individuals. Yeah, I mean, we, I, every leader is faced with this, whether you're talking about making a regulatory decision in a risk-informed environment or personnel decisions or anything else. Um, I think that the, you know, I think Mark and, and Cody have hit on, on the main issues that you got to understand where the person's coming from uh, or per set of people, um, ventilate that, uh, uh, contrast it to what the other position is, and ultimately we need to make a decision and there needs to be a process to make sure the decision maker sees that information and can, can make the, ultimately make the decision. Uh, I think that needs to be done in a, in a timely manner so that we can move on. Um, and you know, Cody's talked several times about the rate of change that they've been in. We're, at the beginning, we're in an inflection point right now for this industry, and I think we're going to be confronted with more of this. We're going to have to be able to process through these uh, quickly, uh, and ultimately... Um, it is going to come down to management having to to make that call. Be quick. Own the decision. Uh, be clear about who the decision maker is. It's something that's baked in at our Be Risk uh, Smart framework. Be clear up front. Be inclusive of the folks' views. Listen carefully. Um, there may be a lot of emotion tied behind that conversation. If you don't listen carefully and set aside the the perhaps more emotional response that can happen from time to time, you may be missing out on some insight there and setting yourself up for failure. The other factor is that while decisions need to be made timely, uh, there's also feedback and operating experience. They're not uh, immutable to change. If something significant does arise, we have processes, we have monitoring, we have expectations to react in the moment to emergent issues. Uh, this is something we have learned time and time again in the nuclear sector. And so reemphasizing that, yes, there will be oversight and monitoring to make sure that the outcome of that decision is still correct and maintained appropriately. So I just want to throw that in there. Those were really fantastic answers. I really appreciate all of the input from the panel. What a great way to uh, draw to a close. Um, for our audience, you are invited to scan the QR code and share any thoughts or insights you may have pertaining to this session or the conference in general. I'd like to thank each of the panelists for sharing your time with us today. I want to thank all of our audience members for participating in the live polling questions and for the insightful and thought-provoking questions provided during the Q&A. I would also like to thank the session coordinators, Chen Pan, Daniel Ju, and Daniel Silverstein for their exceptional support in preparing for this session. 
And uh, just a note for those of you in the room, if you have follow-up questions that you would like to talk with any of the panelists, uh, please move to the exits. The panelists will be right outside the ballroom shortly so we can make way for the next session. And with that, I would like to just give a round of applause to all of our panel members. Thank you again so much.